first start off uh, with these presentations by providing a basic definition of what a vertebrate pest species is. And this is one of the more common textbook definitions that you're likely to find. Uh, they are non-human species of vertebrate animals that are currently troublesome locally or over a wide area uh, to one or more persons, either by being a health hazard, a general nuisance, or by destroying food, fiber, and natural resources. So what does this mean? Well, essentially it means that a vertebrate pest can be something as small as a ground squirrel, all the way up to a black bear hanging out in your backyard. <laughs> the important point to remember here is that these species are not inherently pests. They're only pests when they start causing problems for people. So in the case of something like a black bear, usually they're not a pest. Usually they're walking through the woods doing what bears do. Um, but for other species, particularly a lot of the rodent species, when they're found around people, they're usually uh, serving in some pest capacity. And so usually we have to do something to try to manage those situations. But it is important to realize these species are not inherently pests. Uh, realistically, they're wildlife that are occasionally pests. Now currently, we do recommend that we utilize an integrated approach when it comes to managing these different species. Now by integrated approach, essentially what I'm talking about is utilizing multiple techniques. Uh, we find that we have much better success when we rely on multiple techniques. Um, so I realize these are ag photos here, but they certainly would apply to, um, to a master gardener setting as well. So for example, uh, the use of habitat modification, keeping vegetation low, can be a really good way to deter certain pest species. Metavol is one example, we'll talk about that. But oftentimes that's not enough to completely control that pest population, so then you may have to follow that up with an additional technique. And sometimes that's the use of bait, sometimes it's the use of traps, sometimes the use of burrow fumigants, etc. There's lots of different options that we have depending upon the species that we're talking about. But the important point I want to uh, drive home here is that oftentimes it is a combination of approaches that's going to be most effective, rather than relying on any single one approach. It's also important to understand a little bit about the biology of the species that you're working with, as well as the ecology of the system that you're working in, as that will greatly increase the efficacy of your management programs as well. Uh, this chart here is one that uh, we're going to see several times today because I think it has a tremendous amount of useful information on it. Uh, this chart is designed specifically for the California ground squirrel. And what we see on this chart are major activity periods, major food sources, and the best time for control for three of the more commonly used techniques for managing ground squirrels. Uh, so what's this chart telling us? Well, one of the first things I notice when I look at this chart is the major food sources. And I see that in springtime, Ground squirrels are eating primarily green foliage. Why is this important? Well, it's important because the baits that we use to control ground squirrels are, in fact, seed or pelletized type baits. But we see that they're not eating baits or seeds until later in the year. So if we want to use baiting as a control technique for ground squirrels, we're much better off waiting until later in the year when ground squirrels switch over to eating seeds naturally. So what do we do if we want to control ground squirrels in the springtime? Well, we do have a few options, uh, one of them being burrow fumigation. We see that burrow fumigation works quite well in the spring, but does not work so well later in the year. Why is that? Well, the reason why is with burrow fumigants, we typically need um, high soil moisture. Uh, we need soil, um, the moisture in the soil to close off the pores in the soil to keep the gases from dissipating at a very high rate. If you apply when the soil is relatively dry, the gases can dissipate through that soil at a fairly high rate, makes them less effective. But if you do it when you have relatively high soil moisture, you have much greater efficacy. And of course, here in California, we get a lot of our precipitation in late winter, early spring. So that makes it an ideal time to go ahead and use burrow fumigants as a control technique for ground squirrels. So these are just two examples of knowing, how knowing a little bit about the species that you're working with, as well as the ecology of the system that you're working in, can greatly increase the efficacy of your management program. So with that, uh, we're next going to get into what I consider to be a four-step process when helping to, uh, or when trying to uh, design and implement a management program for dealing with these sort of pest species. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is very quickly outline that four-step process, and then we'll get into greater detail into each one of these uh, different uh, steps as we go on throughout the rest of our, our time here today. The first step, though, hopefully this is fairly intuitive, that is identifying the species that's causing damage. Certainly, you do need to know what species it is before you can develop a management program. Sometimes this is relatively easy. Sometimes it can be fairly difficult, as one of the examples you had earlier today with the, the flower consumption. Um, there are many situations where it can be fairly difficult to tell what species is causing problems. For example, I was sent this photo here a few years ago. 
a bunch of open holes uh, in between some, some grapevines. What was causing that? Well, I can think of two and maybe three different species that could be causing this. And just by looking at the photo, I really could not tell definitively which one it was. I would have had to have been there on the ground looking for some additional detail. Uh, two of the most likely culprits would be a meadow vole or a pocket gopher. Really important that we were able to discern whether or not it was gophers or voles, though, before we implemented the management program, because the management actions are quite different for the two species. For example, if we wanted to use bait to control gophers, we would apply the bait below ground directly into the tunnel system. If we were applying bait for voles, we actually would be applying it above ground. So, if it was actually gophers, but we thought it was voles, when we broadcast the bait out there on the ground, number one, we probably would not be effective at managing that particular problem, but number two, it would be an, an illegal application because we were not applying it for the appropriate species. So that's just one example of how it is really important that you do know what species it is that you're dealing with before you uh, start implementing that management strategy. A vole, we're going to see photos here in just a little bit. So, now, let's assume that you've identified the pest species that is causing problems in that particular situation. The next step then is to assess the different options you have for managing that species. And depending upon the species that we're talking about, we could have quite a few options or relatively few options. Um, there's lots of different things to consider when deciding upon which one of those options would be most appropriate as well. For example, the time of year that you want to implement a management strategy. We've already talked about how that influences efficacy. Uh, the cost of a potential treatment type, uh, whether or not there are endangered species present in the area. Uh, lots of different things that you need to consider when deciding upon which management option that you want to select. The third step then, after you've assessed the different options, you've figured out what is potentially possible and what is not, then it's time to go ahead and actually develop and implement that management program. And the fourth and final step then is to go ahead and monitor, monitor for efficacy afterwards. Now this will oftentimes be less important from a master gardener perspective. If you have one or two gophers in your backyard, you set traps, you get rid of those one or two gophers, that's your monitoring, essentially. You know you've solved that problem. But in some cases, you'll get phone calls from people with small ranchettes, maybe three or four or five acres in size, and they have ground squirrels out there. Uh, maybe they utilize some kind of a baiting program to try to manage those ground squirrel populations. They need to go back after they implement that bait to, to do some assessing whether or not that bait was effective. If it wasn't effective, then they need to ask themselves why. Why was it not effective? What can I do differently next time uh, to increase the efficacy of that management program? But it's really important with a lot of these rodent species that you know what level of control you're getting. Because rodent species reproduce at a very high rate. And so let's say you had a four acre ranchette and you applied bait and you got rid of 50% of your ground squirrels. You may be feeling good. But in reality, those ground squirrels are very easily going to replace themselves during the next reproductive cycle, and you're going to have just as many ground squirrels as you had the previous year. You'd be much better off knocking that population down to 90% or so of what it once was. Then you'll feel like you've had some long-term <coughs> effect. Um, it's actually beneficial uh, in that capacity as well, not just for you, but for the environment and other species out there, because if you're constantly baiting and you're constantly removing 50% of the individuals, then you have to keep baiting every single year at a high rate. Whereas if you knock them down to very low levels, then hopefully you won't have to do it for a little while. Uh, so there's real benefits from that perspective as well. So monitoring sometimes can be a really important part of an effective management program too. So with that, let's get into a little greater detail into each one of these four steps. And the first step, of course, was species identification. So we're going to quickly cover some of the um, uh, different vertebrate species that you're likely to get phone calls about. The first one I want to talk about is the California ground squirrel. Uh, this is one of the two most damaging rodent pests here in the state, um, excluding your commensal rodents, your rats and your mice. I'm not talking so much about them. Um, but specifically talking about those that you find out uh, in backyards and gardens and things like that more, more commonly. Uh, the California ground squirrel um, is a social animal. You do find them in groups together oftentimes. Uh, they are grayish brown in color. They have a semi-bushy tail. As the name would imply, they certainly do live underground. They have burrow systems underground that they like to hang out in. Uh, the damage that they cause is by girdling of trees, such as what we see here, uh, consumption of forbs and grasses, 
uh, chewing on hoses, irrigation lines, just about anything, quite frankly. Um, this is one of the more common forms of damage that ground squirrels cause, resulting in millions and millions of dollars annually uh, throughout the state. Uh, their abundant burrow openings cause lots of problems as well. Uh, they can be at the base of a, of a building, uh, can lead to instability in the building. A base of the tree can cause the tree to fall over. Uh, they're a hazard on parks, athletic fields, golf courses, places like that. Uh, can result in a loss of, of water down those burrow systems, which can exacerbate erosion issues. Real big problems on, on dams, dikes, levees, things like that as well. Uh, so, very damaging species. Fortunately, ground squirrels are diurnal. But this means they're active during the day. This is fortunate because it means it is typically very easy to tell when you have ground squirrels present in an area, as opposed to some other species when it's a little bit more difficult to tell what species is causing problems. Um, as far as locations for ground squirrels to burrow, they do like to burrow underneath buildings. That's obviously a cause for concern. Uh, they like to burrow on field edges, alongside fence rows, roadsides, places like that. This gives you some ideas of, of areas to look for ground squirrel activity. That being said, though, you can find a burrow just about anywhere, um, anywhere they decide to start one. Pocket gophers are the second species I wanted to talk about. Um, gophers are perhaps the most damaging of, of these uh, rodent species here in the state. They're pretty much ubiquitous throughout the state of California. Uh, they're burrowing rodents about six to eight inches in length. They are, of course, rarely seen above ground, so if you haven't seen a gopher before, there's a gopher. Um, because they are rarely seen above ground, though, you have to look for some other form of sign to know that they're present. Of course, what we're typically looking for with gophers are their mouths. Uh, this gives you an idea of what a perfect example of a gopher mouth will look like. Uh, usually horseshoe shape in appearance, with a plug towards the lower end of one side of the mouth. Uh, this is in contrast to mole mounds, which tend to be more conical shaped with a plug in the middle. And I will show you an example of a mole mound here in a little bit. <coughs> Gophers are also a very damaging species. Uh, they feed on the tap roots of plants, thereby weakening and or killing them. Uh, they certainly will girdle trees too, particularly below ground, and here's an example of what that girdling activity can look like. Uh, even though it looked like it occurred above ground, the soil actually has been removed from around, uh, around the base of the tree to expose that girdling activity. And because it's occurring below ground, that means it's typically very difficult to know that it's occurring until you start to see a loss in vigor of that particular tree or vine. Um, once you see that loss in vigor, it's probably too late. You're probably going to lose that tree or vine. And odds are, if it's happening to one or two out there, it's probably happening to more trees or vines than that. And so you can have a fair amount of damage over a very short period of time from gophers. <clears throat> Their mounds also cause a lot of problems as well, very similar to, to um, ground squirrel burrows. Uh, in this case, the mounds actually can directly kill plants just by burying them. Uh, they can bring up weed seeds to the surface, uh, thereby leading to uh, greater weed problems. Uh, they serve as a hazard on, on athletic fields, parks, um, places like that. Uh, hazards to um, equipment, for example, lawnmowers, things like that can also <coughs> damage lawnmowers. Uh, leads to um, uh, soil erosion issues, etc. So lots of problems caused by them. This takes us to an entirely different critter, the mole. Um, <clears throat> moles are burrowing mammals. They have a pointed snout, broad feet, very small eyes. They are very, very different than gophers. Um, in fact, moles are insectivores. They are not rodents. Gophers are rodents. Moles are insectivores. This is important because although gophers will eat plants directly, that's what they consume on a day-to-day -day basis, moles do not. Moles are eating primarily worms, grubs, other insects like that. So they are not damaging plants directly. So from that perspective, they are certainly less damaging than pocket gophers. Now, mole mounds in your yard still are not exactly beautiful, depending upon who you're talking to, I suppose. Uh, so there's certainly plenty of situations where moles cause problems, but they are less damaging than gophers because of that. Um, <clears throat> As far as identification, what you're going to be looking for are their mounds, once again. And this is an example of a mole mound. Uh, they're usually conical shaped in appearance. The plug will either be right in the middle of the mound, or in some cases, it simply is not present. You really can't tell that it's there. Uh, so that's one diagnostic. However, I really like to look at the consistency of the soil itself uh, as another diagnostic. 
If you think back to the um, the photo here with the gopher, it's mostly loose dirt, whereas with the mole, it's got large chunks associated with it. The reason why is when the mole's digging around, it's got those big broad feet that it kind of swims through the soil. But, but when it comes out of the top of this, uh, comes through the surface of the soil, it actually kind of erupts out of the soil. So it's pushing it up, and everything just kind of pushes up with it. So you get those big clods of dirt to come up with it. Whereas the gophers, they're really just kind of digging and shoving and digging, and so the soil is a much looser, finer texture to it. Uh, so that's a really good diagnostic to use as well to help you discern the difference between the two. Something else you can look for are these raised linear ridges. Moles create these when they're foraging just under the surface of the soil, looking for worms and grubs and those kinds of things. Moles are the only thing that will create these. So if you see these out there, you know there are moles present in that area. Now, just because you have these doesn't mean you don't have gophers as well. Uh, so you still have to be able to look for both. But at least if you see this out there, you do know that moles are present in that area. This takes us to the vole, also known as meadow mice. Yes, it's another common name for the, for the meadow mole. Uh, they are dark grayish brown in color, about four to six inches in length. This means size-wise, they're definitely smaller than a gopher, but they're also a little bit bigger than a house mouse or a deer mouse. Mm -hmm. One of the really difficult aspects about dealing with voles is that their populations do tend to cycle quite a bit. Um, so you can have, essentially, very low vole populations for several years, mm -hmm. and then literally in one year you can get this huge spike in vole populations. It can feel like you're being overrun by voles. Mm -hmm. In those situations, they are very damaging. Uh, when there's just one or two around, you're usually not going to see a tremendous amount of damage. But when you have very high vole populations, you can see a whole lot of damage, and it can occur in a very short period of time. Uh, so trying to manage them in those situations is a very difficult proposition. For voles, you're also going to be looking for uh, several different forms of, of sign. Um, they have these open burrow systems. So whereas gophers typically have closed burrow systems, voles have open burrow systems, usually about an inch to inch and a half in diameter. They also have runways or trails that go back and forth between these openings. They really like to stick to these runways. They don't like to deviate off of them much at all. Here's another example of what one of these runways can look like. The fact that they really adhere to these runways so fastidiously really is a benefit to us because we can increase the efficacy of our management programs by taking advantage of that fact, and we'll talk about that later today as well. Uh, you can also look for fecal pellets and grass clippings in these runways to tell if they're active uh, as well, so that's another, way to, another um, identification tool that you can use to, to help manage those situations. As far as damage, um, girdling of stems is a really common form of damage, newly planted trees and vines. Uh, that can gurgle, cause quite a bit of damage that way. Uh, direct consumption of vegetation, gnawing on the irrigation pipe. Uh, road, any rodent species is always going to be a problem when it comes to gnawing on the hoses, the irrigation pipe. Um, anything weird that's plastic out there that you can't figure out why they're chewing on for, from some species of rodent. Um, incidentally, does anybody know why they're constantly chewing on these kinds of devices? Sure. Because their teeth are always growing. That's exactly right. Rodents, their incisors grow throughout their lifetime. If they aren't constantly wearing them down, they can act, their mouth can actually close shut. So they do have to keep chewing on things throughout their life to, to keep them worn down. What size is that pellet? Uh, really small. <laughs> um, no, smaller than that. Yeah. Uh, like. Grain of rice. Yeah, closer grain to a grain of rice. A plump grain of rice would probably be a good example. Yeah. Tree squirrels uh, certainly can be problematic in, in many cases as well. Uh, there are four species of squirrel, um, tree squirrels, here in California. Two of them are native, two of them are not native. Uh, the one that is most damaging is, you, is this guy right here. Uh, this is a, a non-native uh, exotic species. It's the uh, eastern fox squirrel. It's also the largest and, and most aggressive of, of the uh, squirrel species that we have. Uh, this is the one that's usually causing problems, but the western gray squirrel can be problematic in some cases as well. The western gray is a native species uh, here in California. Yes? Uh, this is probably a silly question, but how do you tell the difference between a ground squirrel and a tree squirrel? Because I think well, I've I'm, seen plenty of tree squirrels, yes. and I know I have ground squirrels, yes. but I've never seen one. I was, I gonna, I was just going to ask that. Okay. 
<laughs> and everybody always says the tail. And yes, you can use the tail. Um, but I would say the easier way is to just chase the squirrel. <laughs> the, if the squirrel climbs a tree, it's a tree squirrel. If it goes down the burrow, it's a ground squirrel. And uh, it, it sounds kind of silly, but, but it really does work. Because even though ground squirrels, they, they do climb trees, but they don't climb trees to get away from danger. They go down burrow systems to get away from do danger. Do they walk on, on electrical wires? Yes. They can. But probably it's, it's more likely a, a fox squirrel or some other tree squirrel species. I, I, I wouldn't expect them to do that too much. Um, just like ground squirrels, though, they are diurnal. So they are active during the day. You certainly will see tree squirrels active uh, when they're around. They certainly consume nut crops, fruits, things like that in your backyard. They will dig holes in lawns. They're not digging burrow systems, but they dig holes to cache nuts and, and foods like that. Um, chew on cables, nest in buildings, these are common examples of, of damage uh, in residential areas as well. Hares and rabbits are certainly problematic. Uh, we have jackrabbits and cottontails. Jackrabbits are actually hares, they are not rabbits. Um, small difference, but, but important. Uh, they are larger than cottontails and they have longer ears. Uh, the damage they cause is by primarily foraging on stems. They will girdle uh, a young stems. So while if they're small enough, they'll, they'll chew the tops off of them as well. Uh, and they feed on leaves of plants. Uh, these are a more common pest in, in agricultural areas, areas further away from buildings, etc. Uh, the cottontails are actually true rabbits. They're smaller and they're sh they have shorter ears. And these are a more common pest in residential areas, particularly problematic around nurseries, landscape areas, those kinds of situations. They can certainly be damaging in, in those kinds of areas. And then deer. Um, deer can be problematic in some areas. In many cases, they're not present, but when they are present, they can certainly be pest species. Uh, getting into your backyard <coughs> crops um, as well. Uh, they like to, to nibble on shrubs and bushes in your yard, et cetera. So they can cause a lot of damage in those areas. You're usually only seeing them, though, when you're in close proximity to forested or riparian areas. So in many cases, like I said, deer won't be problematic, but where they are found, they can be uh, pretty damaging and difficult to, to manage, too. Um, deer do tend to be crepuscular or nocturnal, so you don't oftentimes see them running around. Um, usually, you're looking for some form of sign to know that deer are present. Uh, so you can be looking at looking for footprints, uh, pellet groups that they leave behind, foraging damage, etc. Uh, some examples of, of ways to tell that if they're present or not. I have another question. Yes. How big is their poop? I'm just curious. Um, so, so that it comes in pellet form, if you will, um, and there's usually a bunch of them. So it depends on the size of the deer, but I mean they can be you know relatively small to fairly large. Yeah. Usually it's a man. Back to the squirrels and. Uh, mainly the squirrels. Um, so you didn't address the uh, plague uh, situation with them too. Isn't that a big problem for us? Plague is still present in ground squirrel populations. Um, very localized areas and it seems to move around a little bit so it's not like one area always has it per se. There are some areas where it tends to be more common uh, particularly in some of the foothill areas of the Sierra Nevadas but also in LA County and Orange County some of those areas around there as well. There may be cases, recent cases in San Diego, I'm not sure. Well, the, um, the big tree squirrels that we have periodically, they seem to die off in, in big numbers. And I don't know if that's due to the plague or if that's just a... Probably problem. not, but it's possible. Uh, these, all these wildlife species carry a wide variety of different diseases. Uh, so any potential, any number of potential viruses or bacteria could be, could be possible on that. But yes, ground squirrels do carry plague in certain areas of the state, so you do have to be, be careful about that. Yeah. Somebody else had a question? Birds. Um, certainly there are a wide variety of bird species that, that can be pests as well. In fact, just about every bird species could be a pest from time to time. Um, but these can include ducks, geese, crows, magpies, starlings, house finches, scrub jays. Uh, woodpeckers are another common example of, of a damaging bird species. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about um, uh, managing uh, bird problems. But from a master gardener perspective, this is a really difficult one to tackle because there's not a whole lot of effective techniques for dealing with a lot of these species, particularly 
um, when you're talking about just somebody in their backyard, so to speak. Um, Ag production has some tools they can use that really are practical um, for urban areas. So those are the spe uh, species we're going to be covering in greater detail. Obviously, there's lots of other wildlife species. We can talk about skunks. We can talk more about rats and mice. And if somebody has questions about those kinds of issues later today, feel free to ask. But I had to cut the, cut the level off somewhere to fit everything <laughs> in. So uh, those are some of the ones that we're going to be focusing our, our talk on today, information on. So now that you're all experts at identifying <laughs> pest species and, and damage caused by these species, uh, we'll assume now that you'll be able to identify them when people call in, right? 